Yes. Hey, real quick, if you're in here and you can hear me, if you could sit close together, make room. We got a lot of people coming in, a lot of seats. Squeeze up against the wall if you're on the edges and squeeze into the middle if you're toward, uh, if you're in the middle seats. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. He is risen. He is risen All right, let's do that again. He is risen. He is risen Did you know that Christians have been doing that ever since the resurrection? That ever since the resurrection, the glorious day that Jesus conquered death, people have been saying to one another to remind themselves of the glorious reality, He is risen. And then the people who hear that, what do they say in return? He is, risen. he is risen indeed. We are testifying this morning to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As a historical reality, we are here to celebrate. We are here to preach His Word. We are here to learn from Him what we ought to do with our lives, how we are to live for Him. If you're a visitor this morning, welcome. We're glad you're here. You got an inside seat. Good for you. There's a whole bunch of people out there freezing so that you could be in here this Easter Sunday. We're glad you're here. If you're not used to church, let me just explain some of the things we'll be doing this morning. We are going to do basically what we do almost every Sunday. We're going to sing together. We're going to read scripture together. We are going to pray together. And then we're going to study God's word together looking at a passage in the Bible that I'll preach through. Hey, listen, if you're not a Christian and you're here maybe with some friends or family and questions come up in your mind, you're wondering, what does that mean? Or what, is he, uh, what, what does he mean by that? Uh, why do you do that in your church service? Listen, please come talk to me or any number of the church members around you and we want to help you understand who we are and what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, as we gather this glorious Resurrection Sunday. All right, let's begin our service with a call to worship. I'm going to ask you all to stand up, and I'm going to read a passage from John chapter 11, and then we're going to sing together praise to our Lord. In John 11, verses 25 and 26, it says this, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in Me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives 
and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Let's worship the Lord. Born our sin through sacrifice to conquer every sting of death. Sing, sing hallelujah. For joy awakes as dawning light when Christ's disciples lift their eyes. Life, he stands their friend and king. Christ, Christ, He is risen. Christ is risen, He's risen indeed. Oh, sing hallelujah. Join the chorus, sing with the redeemed. Christ is risen, He is risen indeed. Where doubt and darkness once had been, they saw Him and their hearts believe. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet sing hallelujah. Once bound by fear, now bold in faith, they preach the truth and power of sin. And pouring out their lives they gain life, life everlasting. Christ is risen, He's risen indeed. Oh, sing hallelujah. Join the chorus, sing with the redeemed. Christ is risen, He is risen indeed. The power that raised him from the grave now works in us to powerfully save. He frees our hearts to live his grace. Go tell of his goodness. Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. Oh, sing hallelujah. Join the chorus, sing with the redeemed. Christ is risen, He is risen indeed. He's alive, He's alive. Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive, He's alive. Now in heaven glorified. He's alive. He's alive. Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive. He's alive. Now in heaven Shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to Him. Where steady arms of mercy reach to gather children in. Reach 
rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice, one heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, rejoice. whose joy is morning sun and those weeping through the night come those whose joy will have battles won and those struggling in the fight for his perfect love will never change and his mercies never cease but follow us through all our days with a certain hope of peace. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, Rejoice. Come young and old from every land, men and women of the faith. Come those with full or empty hands, find the riches of his grace over all the world his people sing sure to shore we hear them call the truth that Christ through every age our God is all in all rejoice rejoice let tongue rejoice one heart one voice O church of Christ rejoice 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 let every tongue rejoice one heart one voice Church of Christ, rejoice. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. Well, I invite you to grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll be reading a couple of different sections from this chapter. We have sung of the risen king, and now we have the opportunity to read in Scripture the testimony of the risen Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll start in verse 1 and read down through verse 6. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And now look down to verse 19, and we'll read through verse 28. Verse 19 says, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, 
the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. We're going to pray right now a prayer of thanksgiving. Together, we are going to pray and give thanksgiving to our great God and to our risen Savior. I will pray and invite you to pray along with me in your heart. And then when I finish and say amen, would love for you to respond to say yes, that is our prayer together by saying amen. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, we praise you. We give you great thanks for the gospel, the good news of Jesus that brings salvation. The good news of Jesus who lived, died, was buried, and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Father, you are the creator, perfect in holiness and justice. While you are slow to anger, and abounding in love, you will not let the guilty go unpunished. We have all sinned against you, ignoring you or rejecting you in the world that you have made. And though our rebellion against you deserves your just wrath, you made a way for us to be at peace with you. You so loved the world that you gave your only son, Jesus. He lived the perfect life that we could never live. And then he died the death that we deserved. Though the payment of our sin is eternal death, the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we humbly say thank you. Since we know that there is nothing we can do to make ourselves righteous, we could never earn salvation with our good works. Thank you that Jesus conquered death. He rose again on the third day. He vanquished sin and death and Satan. We need not fear death any longer. Jesus was raised for our justification so that we could be declared righteous in your sight. And as he was raised to life, so we know that all who repent of their sin and trust in him alone have the promise of being resurrected to eternal life as well. Thank you. Though in this life we face trials of various kinds, thank you for holding us and keeping us by your power. Even in the trials you are at work, refining our faith, weaning us from lesser joys, and causing us to long for your eternal kingdom. We have a living hope because Jesus is alive. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. And one day, we pray it soon, he is going to come again and will complete a final victory over every rival authority and power. Until that day, how grateful we are that we don't walk alone. Thank you that your Holy Spirit indwells us and has joined us to your people in the local church. Your plan of redemption, Father, will not fail. Thank you for the privilege of being a part of your family, of belonging to Christ and serving as your ambassadors, and for the opportunity to join you in your global mission to make disciples of all nations. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'd ask that you'd be glorified in our lives, in this church, and all over this globe. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Let's stand and sing the power of the cross and come behold the wondrous mystery. To see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten, then nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. Took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. to see the pain written on your face bearing the awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed crowning your blood stained brow the power of the cross Christ became sin for us took the blame bore the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross the daylight flees now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head curtain torn in two dead or raised to life finish the victory the power of the cross Christ became sin for us took the blame bore the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross oh to see my name written in the wounds for through your suffering I am free death is crushed to death life is mine to live one through your selfless love is the power of the cross son of god slain for us what a love what a cross we stand forgiven at the cross Behold the wondrous mystery 
in the dawning of the King, He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, He the perfect Son of Man. In his living, in his suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand come behold the wondrous mystery Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory the price of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace unmeasured love Please be seated. What a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope. It is that hope that leads us to pray, to pray a prayer of supplication where we bring our requests to God. We recognize that our hope is certain. It is sure. It is unshakable because Christ's death is a foretaste, or excuse me, Christ's death and resurrection is a foretaste of ours as well. And yet we look around us, and what do we see? A lot of sin, a lot of brokenness, a lot of suffering, a lot of people who don't yet know Christ as their Savior. So that causes us to come to our Father and to bring our request to Him. We're going to do that now and pray together a prayer of supplication. Bow with me, please. Lord, we do come to you with hope that is unwavering, with hope that is living because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And so we come with hope, we come with anticipation, we come in response to your commands to bring our requests to you. So we're asking, we're seeking, and we're knocking this morning. 
knowing that you love to give good gifts to your children. And we trust you to do only that which is good in our lives. For our church, Father, we pray that there would be a growing culture of evangelism. May we embrace our identity as your ambassadors and seek to share the good news of the gospel with our friends, family members, and neighbors. We pray that it would be increasingly normal for us to be praying for unbelievers, showing Christ's love to them, reading the Bible with them, answering their questions, and inviting them to church. With your help, let these activities be the joyful overflow of our hearts that are truly amazed by your grace. And even today, we pray for opportunities to speak the gospel here at church or in our gatherings afterward. As we obey, help us to humbly trust you to change hearts. Within our congregation, we pray for our singles. Thank you for them and for the essential role they play here at Grace Rancho. May they be devoted in heart and mind to Christ. May they be eager to be equipped for ministry and to use their unique gifts to serve this church family. Free them from selfishness and help them to steward their time, money, and energy every day for your glory. May we as a church family love our singles well, encouraging them, pursuing them, inviting them into our lives, that our life together as a church would be a beautiful picture of gospel unity. As we think of gospel unity, we recognize that we are not just joined to one another here in this local congregation, but we think of the church universal, all those whom you have called to yourself. And we pray this morning specifically for the persecuted church, for our brothers and sisters around the globe in places like Russia, China, North Korea, the Middle East, and Central Asia. They live in countries whose governments and fellow citizens oppress, harass, imprison, and even kill Christians. We pray for faithfulness and steadfastness in the midst of genuine threats to their physical safety. Fill them with fresh courage and resolve to live for you. May they endure as they fix their eyes on Jesus. We pray that their speech and their conduct in the face of opposition will be a powerful witness to the transforming power of Jesus. We also think of our mission partners, Shannon and Danielle Hurley, and the entire staff at SOS Ministries in Uganda. Father, work in their hearts. May their marriage be strong. Help them to be faithful at home with their children. May they be humbly dependent upon the spirit and prayer as they oversee a diverse and growing ministry. We ask that you would provide for them financially, physically, spiritually. Give them each day their daily bread. For the Shepherd's Training Center, we pray for these pastors who are being equipped to know know your word and how to teach your word and to care for their congregations. May there be great fruit in this recent class of attendees. We pray for Community Bible Church, the church that is there in Cuba Mitwe. We pray that hearts would be transformed and minds renewed by your word. We pray for Legacy Christian Academy, for all the students there to know and love and follow Jesus and take the gospel to their homes, their community, and the nations. As we pray for the countries of the world, we come today to Portugal a country that largely identifies as Christian, but very few have trusted Christ as their Savior. Father, you say in your word that you are gathering a people from every tongue and tribe and nation. We pray that specifically in Portugal, you would transform hearts through the faithful preaching of your word. May church leaders rely upon your all-powerful word to accomplish the change in people's hearts. May they preach Christ, in whom is found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We pray for new churches to be planted and for dying churches to be revitalized. 
We'd ask that you would glorify your great name in Portugal. And not just in Portugal, but here in Rancho and our surrounding communities. May your great name be praised. May your kingdom come and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand. We're going to receive our offering and sing together the goodness of Jesus. Come, you weary heart, now to Jesus. Come, you anxious soul, now and see. There is perfect love and comfort for your tears. Rest here in his wondrous peace. Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus. Satisfied, He is all that I need. May it become what may that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. Find what this world cannot offer. Come and find your joy here complete. Taste the living water, never thirst again. Rest here in his wondrous peace. Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus. Satisfied, He is all that I need. May it become what may that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. Find your hope now in Jesus. He is all he said he would be. Grace is overflowing from the Savior's heart. Rest here in his wondrous peace. Oh, the goodness the goodness of Jesus satisfied he is all that I need may it become what may that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus oh the goodness the goodness Satisfied, He is all that I need. May it become what may that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to pray one more time before we study the Word together and ask the Lord's help. Lord, we now recognize how great You are. We've, we've sung about Your death. We've sung about Your resurrection. And Lord, we also just right now confess that we don't even grasp it as we ought. So help. May Your Word be clear. May our hearts be opened by Your Spirit to understand the greatness of the goodness of Jesus. 
We ask in his name. Amen. All right, well, if you have a copy of the Bible, uh, open up to Ephesians 5. We're going to do what we normally do. Uh, Easter Sunday, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, an opportunity for us to kind of invite you in and let you see what we're normally doing and what we're doing for the sermon is this. We take a passage from the Bible. Uh, we're going through a section of the Bible called Ephesians, and we study it one section at a time to see what God has for us, what He's revealed to us, and how we are to live. And, good for you, this morning we're talking about marriage. That's what our text is about. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, if you have a Bible like mine or one of the ones we uh, give you there, if you don't have your own, it's 978 toward the end of the Bible. Uh, It talks about marriage. This letter was written to a church in Ephesus. These people had just become Christians and The Apostle Paul is teaching them how to live. And he tells them first of all the great things that God has done by His grace and His mercy through Jesus to save them. And then he begins to explain to them how it all changes. Everything changes as a result of knowing Christ. And even he begins to give some directions on marriage. He talks about wives. He talks to husbands. But ultimately, there's something even bigger going on as he describes the meaning of marriage. The meaning of marriage. I wonder what you think about marriage. How is marriage doing as an institution? It's interesting. A lot of surveys and statistics are saying that a growing number of people are convinced that marriage is kind of irrelevant, old-fashioned, that it's a social convention that we kind of either need to completely renovate or just ditch altogether. It's, it's not really fit for modern times. And there are some who are trying to understand what is it about a, this, this, these statistics? Why is it that there are so many people that are, are just walking away from this concept of marriage and the design of marriage? They don't want anything to do with it. And, and many have pointed to two kind of themes that go together that help us understand why our society has really stopped valuing marriage as it once did. And those two themes we could label as idealism and cynicism. On one hand, we are an idealist society. You say, what do you mean by that? You know, every time you watch a romantic comedy, every time you read a book that has romance, any kind of story with romance, kind of presents to you a certain kind of way that the romance takes place. They're always idealistic. Have you ever noticed where the love stories end? They always end right when either the guy gets the girl or they finally come together and all this stuff that gets in the way of the relationship. Then finally, there's the great moment at the end where they, they come together and then the movie ends. You don't get to see what happens next. In other words, you just assume, and this is what we're always told, and they all lived happily ever after. I mean, every Disney movie you've ever watched ends right there. You don't get to see what happens next. Prince Charming kisses Sleeping Beauty. She wakes up, and they live happily ever after. You don't get to hear the story of that happens after that. You know, Prince Charming staying out late again, slaying more dragons. Sleeping Beauty is kind of a nag around the house. Things have been getting hard. They're arguing about the finances again. Not sure about these fairies that are always surrounding our house. You know, you don't get to see the, the difficulty that it comes as part of the marriage relationship. And so what begins to happen? You grow up. You have this romantic view of marriage. You're just going to find the perfect one. You're going to find it. You're going to know in your heart that that's the one. You're going to get married. You're going to ride off into the sunset. The birds are going to start chirping as soon as they see you holding hands. And we get this ideal in our mind. And then we get married. (laughs) Or then reality strikes. And it's like, whoa, not quite what I expected. And what has happened is the idealism that we've imbibed from all the cultural stories that we're listening to turns into, or I should maybe say dissolves into, a kind of cynicism. In other words, we go, well, if the ideal's not true, then maybe none of it's true. Maybe there's no such thing as a happy marriage. 
Maybe there's no such thing as making it work. Maybe just marriage in itself is boring and miserable, and nobody who's married is happy. In fact, in 2008, there was a filmmaker, Dana Adam Shapiro. He's a 30-something-year-old filmmaker, and he realizes that many of his married friends are breaking up, and he decides to create a documentary where he interviews the various couples to tell their story of the end of their marriage. And the film presents happy marriages as impossible. Quote, he says, they are an intractable difficulty. And not only does the film portray marriage as impossibly difficult, but it also portrays marriage as entirely undesirable. The idea, and you've heard this, you hear it in the jokes, you know, it's the ball and chain. You're giving up your freedom. Marriage is debilitating. It finds expression almost everywhere. Comedian Chris Rock put it this way, do you want to be single and lonely or married and bored? As if those are the two only options that are offered to people considering marriage. How's that for cynicism? And so what do we do about marriage? How do we think about it? And I wonder about you. I do think it's time for our society to rethink our approach to marriage and our understanding of what it is. And so often we look around at the wreckage today and it should just come to us. We should as believers, if you're a Christian, go, well, how about we start building on the Scriptures? The Word of God. And that's what we want to do this morning. And if you're not a Christian, I hope to just invite you in to listen to the wisdom of God and how He talks about marriage. Now you might be wondering, who's this sermon for? The answer really is, is everyone. The, the sermon is for everyone. If you're a kid and you're in here right now, you need to know this. If you're married and your marriage is really hard, you need to know this. If your marriage is happy, you need to know this. If you've been through a painful divorce, this is, all, this is for you as well. If you're a widow, you can benefit from this. Whatever you have gone through or in right now, this is for you. Not only that you might know what marriage is and God's design, but what we're going to see is that God invented marriage to point to something glorious. Uh, point to something about Himself that's wonderful and for everyone to hear. And that we ought to understand not only roles in marriage, but the whole point and purpose of marriage. That's for everyone. So we're going to overview Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. The, the sermon will be divided into three headings. Pretty simple, not very creative. They will go like this. Wives, husbands, Jesus. Three points. Three points are wives, then husbands, and Jesus. And we're going to go through and we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about these three different things. So, first of all, wives. Look at the text, verse 22 to 24 of Ephesians chapter 5. And I would encourage you to grab your own copy and follow along. I really wouldn't want you to think this is just one guy's opinion. Um, this is something I'm just going to try to explain what's right there in the text of Scripture. So in Ephesians 5.21, or sorry, 5.22 to 24, the Apostle Paul writes, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives, you should submit in everything to your husbands. Wives submit to their husbands. I wonder how many preachers are explaining this on Easter Sunday. Isn't it true that our culture sees this as downright offensive? Some, of, some people see it as regressive, going back to old-fashioned, outdated ways that don't actually work. You know, what? a lot of surveys are saying that we today as a society are the least happy we've ever been. So I do think it's time to go back to older ways. See what God's wisdom has to say about marriage. Here in this text, in these verses, wives are called to submit to their own husbands. That word submit is a word that describes someone who voluntarily places themselves under the authority of another. In fact, that same word is used to describe soldiers 
who respond to the call of their general to line up under his authority and do that which the general describes. Some people read this and they automatically think this implies that women are inferior or wives are inferior. No way does submission imply this at all. The Bible teaches very clearly from beginning to end that God made men and women in His own image. That that men and women are equal in their standing before God. But they have different roles. And there's nothing that's inferior about their role. It's just a different role. In fact, Jesus Himself as a boy, He was submissive to His parents. Jesus, the greatest being, the Son of God, Eternal One, humbled Himself and throughout His incarnation, voluntarily submitted Himself to people. And I also want you to notice it doesn't say, women, submit to all men. It's not what it says. He's addressing a specific relationship of husbands and wives. And he says, wives, did you notice those two words? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. It doesn't submit to say, submit to all men everywhere or submit to every husband that there is. It says women are called to submit to their own husbands. One man, you, when you marry him, you are giving yourself to him to uh, submit to his authority And the reason you do it is found in the next line. It says that you do this as to the Lord. You see that? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives are not to submit to men because men are inherently better than women, but because the Lord. The Lord is the one who gives this instruction. And as she submits to her husband, she is expressing a greater and higher submission to her Lord. So when a wife loves Jesus and trusts Jesus the Lord, she will be compelled to submit to her husband. She doesn't submit to her husband because her husband is perfect. No husband is. She submits to her husband because her Lord is perfect. And her Lord is not making any mistake in arranging the world the way He has and arranging marriage the way He has. And so the Lord, through the Apostles' writing right here, makes it very clear that wives are to submit to their own husbands as an expression of their submission to Jesus Himself. Verse 23, just again, we're just looking at what what it says. Why should she do this? Verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its Savior. If you were here last week, we talked about God ordering the entire universe in a way where it brings Him glory, and there's structure, and there's design. And here, he makes the statement, Paul, that the husband, he says, the husband is the head of the wife. It doesn't say that he needs to be, he's got to work really hard to be, he's got to try to be, if he's strong enough, he'll be the head. No, it's baked into the reality of marriage itself. The husband is the head of his wife. He says that's part of the reason why wives should submit to their husbands. The husband is given that authority, that position. He says you should do it even as Christ is the head of the church, His body, and is Himself its Savior. So, the church, the people of God, these people that God has saved, He's chosen, He's forgiven, He's gathered by His Spirit, the church is under the authority of Jesus, trusting in Jesus, looking to Jesus. In verse 24 says, is the Church submits to Christ. Wives also should submit in everything to their husbands. 24 might be the most out of all these things. <laughs> perhaps the most radical. Did you see those words? As the church submits to Christ, wives also should submit in everything to their husbands. You might say, submit in everything? Really? There's got to be some limits here, right? Right? And you're actually right. There is a limit. Uh, There's one limit that we want to make very clear. The Bible is very clear. We should never submit to any authority that is asking us to sin. Never. Even if it's a legitimate authority, whether that's a government, whether that's a school teacher, whether that's a husband, that no husband has the right to ask someone to sin. And if a husband does do that, the wife should not obey him. She should not follow or submit to any request that is calling them to sin. 
So if there's a husband and he's saying, hey, hey, you need to lie. He's telling his wife that she should cheat. He's telling his wife that, hey, you're not allowed to pray. Hey, you gotta, you got to keep my illegal stuff that I'm doing. you got to keep that hidden. No, 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 no. She doesn't submit to that. Wives, if you're here this morning, your wife's telling you to sin, you must remember that you have a higher authority than your husband. And it's Jesus Christ. Wives, if your husband is telling you to sin, you don't need to sin. In fact, if he's telling you to hide his sin, maybe the most loving and submissive thing you could do is to not hide it. If he's, if he's doing things illegal, or sometimes that women get in relationships where the husband is physically abusing them and they think, well, I just got to be quiet. I got to submit, right? Listen, if your husband is physically abusing you and endangering your safety, submission does not mean that you remain silent. You have an open invitation to come to us. You should tell people. You should make that public. You do not have to submit to that kind of violence. See, it, it, the, 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 the submission has a limit. The, the wife submits to the husband, but never submitting to the leadership that would lead into sin. The wives don't follow their husbands into sin. The text says the wives should submit in everything to their husbands. You say, okay, well, if my husband's leading me in a direction that's not sin, do I need to submit? The answer, yeah. Yeah, that's what it means. The wife should submit in everything to their husbands. See, the husband, it says there he's the head. He has authority and responsibility to lead. He has to decipher what would honor the Lord, what would be best for the family. He has to decipher what direction to go. Sometimes a wife thinks, well, what if it's really hard for me? Do I still need to submit? What if I don't want to? Do I still need to? Well, the, the, the wife that really trusts the goodness of Jesus and, and loves Him and really does believe that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus has all authority and that Jesus is sovereign and in control of all things, the wife that really trusts Jesus out of love for Christ will submit to their husbands from the heart. A wife should gladly, joyfully submit to her husband in everything except sin. Wives, you're here this morning. You didn't expect to be asked this question on Easter morning, I wonder. Are you submissive to your own husband if you're married? You might know whether you are or not by how you respond to his leadership. Do you affirm it or complain about it? Do you follow joyfully or drag your feet? Do you distance yourself when he does things that you don't prefer or grow cold or pull away? Wives, you want to have a potentially life-changing, marriage-altering conversation with your husband? Maybe sometime this week, what if you said a prayer for humility, got some time alone with him, and said, hey, I want to know, and I want you to be honest, have I been a submissive wife? And then zip your lips, <laughs> don't get angry, and listen to what he might have to say. The text says that in marriage, wives honor the Lord by submitting to their husbands because the Lord is over all of them and the Lord has commanded them. Now, there might be some of you husbands here in the room that are like, yeah, I'm glad we came to church on Easter. <laughs> it's your turn, buddy. Let's talk about husbands. It's not all it says. Now he starts talking to husbands. Now look at verse 25, and I'm going to read through verse 29, or 30, I mean. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, 
but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of His body. We already saw in verse 23 that it says that the husband is head of the wife. He has put you, husband, in a position of authority over your wife and you ought to feel some of the weight of that position. What do you do with that authority? Well, in verse 25, it's very clear that what husbands are called to do with the role of headship that God has given them is they are to love their wives. Now, I'll tell you what. In the ancient world, in in any Jewish culture, any Greek culture, any Roman culture, if Paul only said, wives submit to your husbands, they would have said, yep, okay, we agree. Uh, That wasn't a surprising thing to say. That wasn't even really all that countercultural. Now, how they were to do it was different. But to submit was kind of already understood in that sense. But in the, what would have been new, what would have been surprising, what would have been unanticipated by the readers, remember Ephesus is a city in Greece. It's a Greek city. They would have been surrounded by Greek culture. What would have absolutely surprised them is when now the apostle starts addressing husbands and he tells the husband, love your wife. That would have been surprising. Oh, it was common for men to get married to have an heir. It was common for for men to get a wife so they can have someone to pass everything on to so they could have children. That was common. But to be told that you're to marry someone and love them. That you are to give yourself to them. This would have been countercultural. It's like the new life that Christ brings is breaking into the world in the marriage. See, they're called, they're called to something different. Husbands are not called to submit to their wives. They're called to love their wives. And in the same way as in the previous section, it's not saying that the husband needs to be respectable enough in order to earn the submission of the wife. It doesn't say that. So here, the wife doesn't need to be lovable in order to earn the husband's love. The husband must love the wife. Have affection for the wife. Whether she is lovable or not. Whether she deserves it or not. See, too often wives and husbands are playing this game where the wife is only willing to respect and submit to her husband when the husband is earning the love or the, the respect. And the husband's only willing to love his wife when the wife is acting lovable. It's like that thing that I remember growing up as a kid and you're going to the pool and it's kind of cold. You know you want to get in, but you also are just dreading that moment of the icy splash when you jump in for the first time. And you're there with your friends. You're all standing around the pool. And you're like, who's going to go first? And you're like, I want you to go first. You know? And he's like, no, you go first. And we're all waiting. Who's going to go first? I'll jump when you jump. If you jump, I'll jump. Okay, one, two. You're not jumping. I'm not jumping. And sometimes marriages are like that when the wife's like, okay, you go all in and I'll go all in, but you're not going all in. So I'm waiting out. And the wife's or the husband's doing the same thing on the other side. They're just both sitting around and no one's jumping in. You see, what he's describing here is the wife going all in to submit to her husband because she loves Christ and the husband going all in because what Christ has done for him, he loves his wife, both members of the marriage giving an undeserved gift to one another it's not deserved the wife gives the undeserved gift of submission to her husband and the husband gives the undeserved gift of love to his wife and any of us have been married for any time there go through season where it's sometimes harder it's sometimes easier Sometimes there's more love, there's more respect to go around, sometimes there's less, and it's harder. The biblical way is not for the one to sit and wait to make sure the other one is respectable, then I'll submit. Or she's lovable, therefore I'll love. No, look at actually what the verse says. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church 
and gave himself up for her. What was Jesus waiting around in heaven for us to become lovable? Waiting around for sinners to fix themselves? Waiting around for us to come to Him to earn His love? No, that's the whole point of the Gospel. Is that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And we were following our own desires with no desire to honor the Lord. And in our state of sin, God loved us and sent His Son. And that, husbands, is the model for how you love your wife. Loved, he, Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. You say, well, what does it mean to love your wife as Christ loved the church? It means a lot of things, and you see a bunch of them listed there in the text. If you're new to Christianity, you want to learn more about this, we're going to be studying this, this section in more detail in the coming weeks. So come back next week. But one of the things it describes here is, that, of course, this kind of love is taking initiative. You know, husbands love your wives. Christ loved the church. Christ took initiative. Christ didn't sit back and wait for us to do something. And neither should husbands sit back and wait for their wives to act first in love. Husbands should be initiating love, moving forward to their wives, regardless of what the wife has done. It's a picture of beauty. You're not waiting and reacting love. It's taking responsibility to act like Jesus and love your wife. It's a giving love. You see that there also in verse 25. Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. It's self-sacrificial. It's giving of oneself. It's laying down one's preferences. You see, the husband is put in the position of authority, and what is the position of authority supposed to do? The position of authority is supposed to use its authority to bless, to love, to care. Verse 26, it describes what Jesus did when He gave Himself up. Verse 26, that He might sanctify her. That is, set her apart for Himself. Having cleansed her, by the washing of water with the Word. In other words, the love of Christ is a purifying love. And the love of husbands to their wives should be a purifying love. Husbands should be able to have a goal in mind where they're thinking, my wife should be more holy each year, more like Christ each year as a result of my marriage to her. Notice, look at verse 28. I like this. And this will resonate, I think, with a lot of you, you men here. Verse 20, 28 says, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. As their own bodies. So the first analogy he uses to describe how we should love our wives is Christ's love for the church. The second one is you should love your wife as you love your own body. And then in verse 29, he says, for no one ever hated his own flesh. It's like there's no one who doesn't love their own self, their own body. But what do you do? It says you nourish and you cherish it. In other words, you guys, you guys know this. The default mode of every guy is what do you do when you get hungry? You eat. You get tired? You sleep. You got B.O.? Well, maybe not all of you, but many of you, you'll take a shower. You, 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 you brush your teeth. You're attentive to your body. You, you know what it needs. You are daily and diligently taking care of yourself. And some of you even take this to a greater degree. You're, you're taking your body to the next level. You've got diets you're on. You've got strict exercise plans. You've got it all on the schedule. You've got health goals. You're in the gym many times a week. You're making sure that physique is just what it needs to be. You're caring for your body. And what he's describing here is that husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. And what does that mean? Verse 29 uses the two words, nourishing and cherishing it. You see, the husband's leadership is not domineering and authoritarian. It is love. It is sacrifice. It is care. It is nourishing the wife. It is cherishing the wife. The same kind of attentiveness that you give to your own physical needs, you ought to give to your wife. 
You got to be attentive to her. You know your your stomach starts, you know, growling in there. You do something about it. Are you as attentive to the need of your wife? Now she might need something. She might need attention. She might need a conversation. Uh, she might need care. She might need encouragement. She might need prayer. Husbands, is your authority in your household? helping to make your wife more pure? Are you using the God-given authority to nourish her? To cherish her? Do you pray with your wife? Do you encourage her? Do you lead her in following Jesus? Do you help her to be free from the ravages of sin? Is she, because of your leadership, being well fed, spiritually helped, being made spiritually stable. Wives, how many of you would love for your husband to love you that way? Constantly taking initiative to protect you, to love you, to provide for you, to care for you, to lead you. John Calvin, pastor in the 1500s and theologian, He said of this, and I'll let him use these strong words. Listen up, man. He said, the man who does not love his wife is a monster. And he didn't mean like a Monsters, Inc. kind of monster. He's talking about the kind of person who uses his strength his position, his power, and his authority to take, to take, to consume, to consume, and never to give, and often to hurt. It's a monstrous use of authority. And there are men, maybe there are some in this room right now, that are acting monstrously toward their wives. That they are using their role to exploit and oppress and any husband who is using his wife to satisfy himself, but he does not love her. He does not care for her. Listen, God hears the cries of the oppressed. In Ezekiel 34, there are leaders over Israel that are described as being self-indulgent, feeding themselves while letting the flock starve. And God confronts them. And you know what God says to these leaders? That are, that are exploiting and oppressing the people underneath them, God says, woe to you, I am against you. If there are men in this room or listening online or in the tent, anybody in earshot, who are using their power, using their strength, using their authority to hurt, to take, to steal, to exploit, to oppress, Their wives, listen very clearly, God is against you. You may not use that authority to hurt. You must repent of this monstrous sin and turn to God and beg for mercy. And He will forgive. But He won't let you remain the same. He will transform you to be more as like Jesus describes, to love, to give yourself to nourish, to care. Husbands, our wives have given themselves to us to voluntarily submit themselves to us. That should be a precious thing. And the authority of the husband should be the loveliest, safest, most blessed place for the wife to be. The wife should be Loved, protected, nourished, blessed, because the authority of the husband is being used in such a way to bless those underneath it. All good authority does that. Whether it's a king, whether it's a boss, whether it's a father, all good authority is used to bless those underneath it. And all bad authority uses that power to exploit. What kind of husband are you? Now third, Jesus. The 
This text talks about wives in verses 22 to 24, telling them to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. Verse 25 through 30 describes husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. But I told you at the beginning that marriage actually points to something greater than itself, something bigger. And here we're going to see it points to Jesus. You probably already noticed that as we study this section that the whole thing is filled with the fragrance of Jesus. Why should wives submit to their husbands? As to the Lord, because Jesus is involved. How should husbands love their wives? Like, like Jesus. The whole thing is all pointing back to Jesus. And if you look at verses 31 and 32, the apostle quotes an Old Testament passage in the book of Genesis. He, he quotes Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, and he says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It's the design of marriage given to us in the earliest book of the Bible. And then look at verse 22, or 32. It says, This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ in the church. I wonder if you knew that. That God invented marriage to point to something bigger than marriage. God designed marriage and therefore every single marriage on planet earth reflects something about Jesus. It is designed to point to the relationship of Christ to His church. Marriages are real life parables. Walking pictures of Christ's love for the church. Some marriages really beautifully paint the picture of Christ's love for the church. Some marriages kind of distort it when they're not walking according to God's design. But the whole point is that happy, healthy marriages are hints or pointers to the reality of Christ's love. Marriage is telling a story. It's telling a story about Jesus and His people. Now what, what did, if this is true, what is marriage pointing to? What about Jesus specifically? It's pointing to His love for the church. You say, well, how did He show this love? Look at verse 25. We already mentioned it. Marriage points to this reality that Christ loves the church. Verse 25, love your wives as Christ loved the church. As the husband loves his wife, he is living out in real time, illustrating a little bit of what Jesus is like. And he's pointing to a greater, eternal, unbreakable, unstoppable love that Christ set upon His people before the foundation of the world. What else did Jesus do? He, he gave Himself up for the church. So when the husband sacrificially and repeatedly and consistently gives up his preferences to love his bride, he is pointing back to Jesus. Jesus gave Himself up for the church, it says. Jesus, out of His eternal love, gave an extraordinary sacrifice. Jesus, as the Bible teaches, is not just a moral teacher. Truly God has existed before all things. In Him all things hold together, the Creator of the universe. And in love for His creation, 2,000 years ago, He became a man. He walked among us. He laid His life down to pay for the sins of His people. Our sins deserve punishment. We could do nothing to cleanse ourselves. Jesus stood in our place, was condemned for us. He gave Himself up. And when marriages are functioning rightly, they're pointing back to that. You might say, well, why did Christ have to die? We already kind of looked at it. Look at verse 26. It talks about Christ sanctifying. Uh, that Christ makes us holy. Sets us apart. Cleanses us by the washing of water with the Word. You see, our sin and rebellion is so deep against God that God would be right and just to condemn us for our sin. Jesus, it describes even there, He's called a Savior. He's the Savior. Now, listen. There are so many people who think that Christianity 
It's just about being a moral person. You follow the Christian ethics, maybe even this whole sermon. You've been thinking, okay, I've got to be more Christian. I gotta, if I'm a wife, submit to my husband. If I'm a husband, I've got to just love my wife like Jesus. And you think it's just all about just getting these, these ethics in place. You know how many times I've talked to someone about Christianity and I've, I've asked the question, are you a Christian? And the answer comes, yeah, yeah, I think so. I'm trying. And I follow up, I say, well, what do you mean by that, that you're a Christian? Well, I, I'm, I'm trying really hard. I, I, you know, I've been to church sometimes. I know life's been busy, I haven't been able to make it to church, but I'm really, really trying. Trying really hard to please God. I'm, I'm sincere. Sincere. And you know what I often tell them? I try to do it as lovingly and gently as I can. I try to tell them, hey, listen, that's not Christianity. It's like actually Christianity is like way better than what you're describing there. What you're describing is this thing where you're, you're trying to clean yourself up you're you're trying to make yourself presentable to god it's just not going to work i mean when he's talking about christ died for the church and he's talking about cleansing the church and washing the church what what should be clear is that christianity it's for people who know they need someone to die in their place that they know they're they're sinners they they need cleansing Christianity's not a if you you if you hang around a little bit you get to know some of the members of Grace Rancho. I'll tell you what. Ask them their stories. And you will find one thing in common is that all of them have a past, me included. Of people who have been lost, who have been in rebellion against God and at some point came to grips with the hard reality that they could do nothing to save themselves. And they needed something from the outside to save them because they couldn't do it themselves. And here he's saying marriage is pointing to this great love, this incredible love, this sacrificial love of a Savior from heaven that comes to save sinners. If you thought that, oh, I'm trying really hard to be Christian this week, and maybe I'll hear an inspiring message this Easter, and I'm going to try this week to be an extra good Christian, Listen, the whole point of the Gospel is you can't do it. You can't. And what Paul said in 1 Timothy 1 is that Christ came into the world to save sinners. Not those who are moral and upright who got it all figured out. He said He came for sinners. Jesus Himself said that He didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. Get to know any one of us. We know that we are sick with sin and we're looking outside of ourselves to a Savior. And marriage is pointing to that. And one of the things that it says that Jesus will do after He has come and He has died and He has risen, verse 27 describes that one day, it says the purpose of Him dying and rising is so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor. Beauty. Clean. Forgiven. Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she, that's the church, might be holy and blameless before Him without blemish. Man, I can't wait for that. Christian, can you wait for that day that you will be clean before God entirely? We're struggling still with sin today, right? There will come a day, if you're a Christian, there will come a day that the holy God of the universe will look at you with His blazing eyes of justice. Eyes that will pierce into the very depths of your being. Eyes that will penetrate every thought and every motivation and every idea and every action down to its very core And you will be so clean that what God will see in you will bring Him delight. This is what the work of Christ accomplishes. He's going to present us to Himself in beauty and splendor without spot. Marriage is pointing to that kind of love. Now I wonder, 
especially if you're not a Christian. Whether you've thought about that day that you will stand before God and that He will gaze into your soul. you thought about that? Some people go their whole lives, don't really think much about that. I don't think there could be a more important question. Some people who worry about it all the time, they think about it nonstop. I wonder, wonder about you. Do you think about this day where you will stand before God? He will gaze into your very soul. C.S. Lewis describes this way, describes it this way. He says, in the end, the face which is the delight or the terror of the universe must be turned upon each of us. Either with one expression or with the other, either conferring glory inexpressible or inflicting shame that can never be cured or disguised. The face of your Maker will turn toward you and either confer and give you the glory inexpressible or will give you unceasing shame. And he goes on to say, Lewis writes, I read an article the other day saying, that the most fundamental thing is how we think of God. But it's not. How God thinks of us is not only more important, but infinitely more important. It is written that we will stand before Him, that we shall appear, that we shall be inspected. Have you considered that? That your Maker will turn His gaze toward you? What will He find? When the God of the universe inspects you, sin, guilt, shame. The message that I want to announce to you this morning is good news. For those of you who know that there is in your heart a sin that you can't escape and a guilt that you can't remove and a shame you can't ignore. There is a love story that every marriage is painting, that every marriage is pointing to. It's the story of the love of Christ. Let me explain this to you. Most people, maybe you're one of them, most people think that they're basically good. And they're they're basically sincere and they're trying hard. And because they're good and because they're sincere, God is tolerant and God will let you into heaven. That's what most people think. Let me tell you, that is a lie. A very simple but tricky lie that has deceived millions. And there are many people, and I'm going to use this illustration. I want you to look up here. I'm going to use my hands. i got a visual. I don't do this very much, but i got a visual for you. Most of us, this is, this is my right hand. It's representing me. It's representing you. It's representing everyone. And, and we have in our lives a book of sin. Okay, We all do. This is every thought you've ever had that has been against God's truth. This is every action you've ever done that has been disobedient to the Lord. This is every motivation that you've ever had that was not correct in what God requires of us. And here you have your life and it's filled with various kinds of sins. Some of the sins are very outward and obvious. Many more are inward. You may even have a good outward appearance, but inward there's a sin. And what most people are doing is they're trying to overcome their sin through different religions, through going to church, through more improvement projects. But all they're doing is kind of turning their sin over and over again in different ways. They're not able to get rid of it. And what they what they don't realize is that the sin that plagues them is far deeper than any surface thing they can just get rid of. Jesus said that all these sins in your life proceed from the heart. They're actually more fundamentally part of you because you're an offspring of this fallen race humanity. And so what religion is trying to tell people to do, just try harder, just be more moral, and all you're doing is just turning the sin over and over and over in your life. And yet, here's the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's the good news of the Gospel. It's this. You cannot overcome your sin by trying harder, and you cannot have the righteousness that God requires by working at it. You can't. And now over here, I have Jesus. Jesus has no sin. Jesus is perfectly clean. 
And the message of the Bible is that if you stop trying to overcome your sin in your own strength, and instead give your sin to Christ, you not only will have a salvation from your sins, you will have a righteousness that God requires. You will be forgiven. This is the most glorious reality. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made Him, this is Jesus, who knew no sin, sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. You don't get rid of your sins by trying to overcome them. You get rid of your sins by transferring them. That's it. You look to Christ. You look to His cross. You believe that He can take them. And you say, take my sins because I can't get over them. They're too deep. I'm looking to Christ. And He takes your sins. He pays for them on the cross. He gives you His righteousness and you are clean. This is the best trade imaginable in the entire universe. I've been a Lakers fan and I've watched some trades go down and I got pretty excited. I remember where I was when we got Shaq. Maybe I'm ostracizing a bunch of you non-Lakers fans. I'm a Lakers fan. I remember when we got Pau Gasol. I pumped my fist. I think, yeah, this is a good trade. There's been other trades I haven't been so excited about. I like that player. Why are we trading him away? This is the most glorious trade in the entire universe. What's the trade? You look to Jesus with all your sin. You say, you take it. You pay for it. I can't do it. I can't set myself free. He takes it and pays for it on the cross. And in exchange for your sin, gives you a perfect eternal righteousness. And on that righteousness, you are justified forever before God and reconciled to Him. You see, Christianity is not about being better, trying to earn your righteousness before God, trying to overcome your sin in your own strength. It is none of that. The wrath of God is coming. We will all stand before that face, the face that will look into our very eyes. We need our sins forgiven. We need a righteousness that comes from the outside because we certainly don't have it on the inside. And the only way to do it is to look to Christ. That is the message of Easter. Christ is alive. And if you are a sinner, if you are guilty, if you have nothing of yourself to bring, you can look to Christ. And on that day of judgment, He will see not only no sin, but a perfect record of righteousness. If you're not a Christian, and you're still in your sins, I want to invite you to believe the Gospel this morning. The best trade imaginable. Give Christ all your sins. Confess them to the Lord. And receive freely by faith alone the free gift of righteousness. You don't need more of your own righteousness to get to heaven. That won't do you any good. You need Christ's righteousness. And it's freely available to all who come to Him in faith. If you come to Him, you'll never be cast out. He will forgive all your sins, wash you clean, remove your guilt, relieve your shame, transform your life. He will bring you into your, His household forever, make you a part of His church, and you will have eternity to rejoice for all He's done for you. We here at Grace Rancho have been praying for you. We want you to know the immeasurable love of Jesus. Every marriage points to it. But it is the real thing. Do you know Christ? And maybe some of you have questions that came up in your mind. We're talking about this marriage stuff. You want to talk to someone? Talk to me? Talk to any of the church members around you? I want to help you know how Jesus can help you. Jesus lived, died, and rose for sinners. Turn from all of their hopes and hope in Him alone. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, You are alive. You have conquered sin and Satan and death and hell. You stand as our Lord and King. You sit at the right hand of the Father, saving all who come to You in humble and repentant faith. Lord, I pray that many this morning would receive Christ. That they would give their sins to Him. That they would recognize they're paid for at the cross. 
who believe it, that Christ can make them righteous and forsake all of their hopes and trust in Him alone. Lord, grant new life even now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand as we sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. With the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life No fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell. Amen. What a morning it's been. Thank you for being with us. I just want to say, if you have any questions about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have a booklet that we'd like to give you as a gift. It's called The Gospel of Jesus Christ. So in addition to having a conversation with someone around you, make sure you go to the welcome table, pick up one of those booklets. It will reiterate and help to better explain or more fully explain what Pastor Eric explained in the sermon this morning. I want to read our benediction this morning. It says this from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated for a minute of quiet reflection. <laughs>